Welcome back to the Always Reading Book Club. It is your girl Kiki Reader and we are going to do a standalone. Now this is a part of the Loft House Family Series by B.B. Hamill. We're going to do book one, Possessive Doctor. We meet Amber Gibbons and she's 24. She's walking with a cane. She's going to physical therapy. Her father drops her off in his big truck. She goes in. The receptionist, I think her name was Rachel, uh, gets her information, tells her he'll be out in a minute. He, of course, super handsome doctor. She's a little thrilled by this. He takes her in the back, and we find out she's had an accident. She broke her femur really bad. And for about six weeks prior to this, like she was bedridden with a cast. But now she's at least able to walk with this cane. She'll take that any day over being bedridden. That was absolutely horrible to her. So he stretches her out. He asks her some questions. We find out prior to the accident, she was a runner, went every day. They have some flirty words, you know, him saying, you know, that he should run more, but with his schedule and stuff. But she's like, I don't see where you're missing any workouts, you know. <laughs> um, he's looking her up and down. Uh, it, it's very much, I'm feeling my doctor, I'm feeling my patient. That's the vibe that they're giving. So they make it through some light exercises. They have some more conversation about like the time frame of her healing. Because she wants an honest answer from him. He said it really just depends. Like it could be a month. It could be a year. And she's like, no, tell me realistically. He says, well, honestly, if you do the exercises that I told you to do at home, you could be doing pretty good in six months, not fully healed. But if you keep doing possibly within a year, you could be pretty close to normal, back to normal. And she's like, okay. I, I can deal with that. But she thinks to herself, you know, she doesn't know if she's going to do these every day. <laughs> so she's got an appointment with him for the following week. She leaves out, makes the appointment. We find out a couple of things. He's a physiatrist, which I've never heard that word. I've just always heard of physical therapist. But he's a physical therapist that went to medical school. So he's a physiatrist. Almost, I want to say physicist. That's what I want to say, but it's not that. <laughs> we also find out that this is his practice. Like he owns this clinic. So as Amber leaves, um, you know, she makes that appointment with Rachel, the receptionist. And Rachel tells her, you know, you're really lucky because normally he's not the one doing this. You know, he was just filling in for someone today. He doesn't really work with the patients. Um, and she's like, oh, but he had told Rachel, like, I guess, let her know he's going to be her physicist. Like he's doing this. So then she leaves out. Her dad's not there. He had texted her and told her he was going to be late. He finally shows up. She wanted to go back inside actually while she was waiting, but she didn't want to be embarrassed. So she just stayed outside, just waited, um, in the, in the shade, they live in Texas, right outside of Austin. Her dad pulls up in his big truck, doesn't help her get in, yells at her, tells her she's letting out the AC so we can already see that he's a freaking trip. And she's just like, my bad, I have a broken leg. Sorry, it took me a little longer. So they're driving roughly in silence. She doesn't really talk to her dad. We find out that about 10 years ago, he struck oil and Gibbons Oil was born. And now he's like, if not the richest man in Texas, one of the richest men in Texas. And the minute I read that line, it automatically made me think about Dallas. Um, I grew up with that, watching that, my mom watching that. So I grew up watching it and he just sounds like JR to me. <laughs> my mind goes <laughs> like he's a total jerk 
he, you know, it just, that's where my mind went. So when I imagine it, it's like, okay, you get that type of money, that oil money, you know, like I get it. We also find out he apparently is the reason that she had the accident. Now we don't know what the accident was, but he apparently was at fault. So when they get back to the house, or shall we say when they get back to the mansion, he's like, well, do you need some help getting out? And she's like, no, I'm fine. She's not trying to help him with his guilt. They don't get along too well. Clearly we can see. And she lets us know pretty much that when it comes to her father, this book all does she what is I love is just so much, which is upon POV. to him and his bigger So plan. we switch to Brett's POV. It's later on in that evening. He's got a lot of administration work to do, which he really doesn't like. He does need to hire someone to do this stuff. Um, he, of course, doesn't do this job for money. He wants to help people. We find out that he comes for money. He really doesn't need to do this. But again, he loves to help. So he can't stop thinking about our girl, Amber. And he looks in her file and he's got some concerns. Because based on the x-rays and how she broke it, this doesn't sound like a car accident. Which is what her the file says. This sounds like this was a fall, like a very long fall. So he emails his friend Chuck that works at the hospital, who is the one that referred her over, and just kind of shot him an email saying, hey, I got some questions about this. You know, it says car accident, but it doesn't line up. And then he says, you know, about maybe getting together for drinks X, Y, and Z. Well, it's close to 10 o'clock when he's about to leave and he gets a response back from Chuck. Chuck is like, yeah, I saw that too, but she was adamant that it was a car accident. Her father backed her up and we were so busy and she was in so much pain, you know, we just want, just tried to help her. But yes, yeah, something's definitely off. So now, of course, he wants to know the mystery, you know, what really happened to her. So we fast forward a week. She comes in. He, of course, has been thinking about her all week. She looks like she's in more pain. Well, we find out she's been doing the exercises, but one of them she probably shouldn't be doing. So he tells her, don't do that one anymore if that's that's causing you too much anguish. Don't do that. They do some, some little exercises. She sweats a little bit because, again, these are normally things that she wouldn't, you know, be sweating behind. But, you know, she... She has a major injury. So this takes a lot out of her doing this stuff. They have a little flirty moment. She kind of describes how she got stuck back at her father's house. She describes this as well. She graduated from, I want to say, University of Texas. And then after she graduated, she didn't really know what she wanted to do. And so she wound up coming back home. So she's just kind of been stuck. He's very upfront. And he's like, yeah, he tell, he admits he was looking at her. He's like, you're a beautiful woman, you know? And she's like, isn't that crossing the line? And he's like, yeah, it is. Are you going to report me? She's like, no. He said, well, then I don't see what the problem is. But then he starts poking questions. He starts asking questions about the car accident. So he says to her, you know, your injury, it doesn't really go with like a car accident. He's like, the way that it broke, it seems like it'll be from something else. She immediately gets defensive. She's like, it was a car accident. And don't you call me a liar. <laughs> so he's like, I was just trying to figure it out because it didn't make sense. And she was like, you know what? You're really inappropriate. Now you're calling me a liar. I'm not coming back here. <laughs> He's like, well, you need to come back here if you want to heal. I can help you heal faster. And he tells her, you know, you can call me an asshole. You can be upset with me or whatever, but I can help you. And so as he keeps talking, um... She comes down a little bit. He gives her his number. He's like, listen, call me anytime if you have any questions. And I think he said something. 
what was it? It was something else he said or whatever. But anyway, he gave her the number. And she's like, you want me to call you so you can tell me more things about my body? And he's like, if that's what you want to do, feel free to text me. So she leaves out. She won't let him help her out either because she's still pissy. But when she leaves, she winds up sending him a text message saying something about, you know, he had a great ass as well. So he saved her number, but he definitely is like, he's going to get to the bottom of this because he knows something bad happened to her and he feels like she is probably still in danger we switch back to amber's pov and she's in the truck with her father they're on their way to meet up with some prospects so they're going to meet someone named dave on his ranch and we find out that she is basically being pushed into an arranged marriage her father wants to drill on dave's land and so if he does, this will give him even more money. Keep in mind, I think he's already super rich. So this is m- more about, I think, power. Yes, he wants more money too. Um, but I think it's a power element as well. Because I think once you have so much money, then it turns into, well, how much power can I get? And unfortunately, that can be unlimited. <laughs> so <laughs> that's usually people's downfall. So anyway, he tells her, you know, be nice. You know, we need this to work out, all this stuff. So this is their first time meeting Dave, the owner of the ranch. And he's also the father of the guy who she's supposedly going to marry, whose name is Michael. They've been having all these conversations, but never face to face. Um, Dave and her dad, Samuel. So he, of course, still trying to sell the whole, you know, this is going to make our grandkids rich and all this type of stuff or whatever, which I don't think he cares about. It's more about how long his money is. You know, he wants a, a, a ton of money, a ton of power. But anyway, they get there and uh, Michael comes out. He just kind of looks like she describes him as he's not unfortunate looking he's just kind of average if he worked out a little bit he would be attractive so he's not hideous you know but he's not like he's not fine either (laughs) like the doctor is fine he's like cut and tall and all that great stuff not that you can't be fine and short but you know in these books, they tend to make everyone six feet tall. <laughs> That's attractive. So the fathers go off. They're talking and she's talking with Michael. So here's the issue. Dave doesn't want to sell the land. He wants it to be family. So If they marry now, it's like, okay, if it's just a business that buys it, he, you know, anyone else can, you know, someone else will come in and and swoop up and, and buy it again, or it can be sold, you know, but if they're family, then that means it'll always be someone benefiting on from, you know, on his side. So that's why he's the one that wants this marriage. Because he's not accepting just the funds from good old Samuel. So Amber's talking to Michael and he's just like, oh, you're hot. I didn't think you were going to be hot. I thought you were going to be fat and ugly. And then I wasn't going to do it. But now I'm into it. And he also tells her, you know, he's trying to make sure there's other concessions that are made on his end. Because he's not just doing this for his dad. You know? So... She's talking to him, but she's bored, you know, so she winds up texting with our boy, Brett. He's at work doing his administrative work, which he hates. So she's like, it sounds better than what I'm doing right now. This boring conversation. So Michael winds up leaving, going where the fathers are. And then she goes where they are. And basically it's kind of set, even though she hasn't said yes yet. They've made the decision that this is going to happen. They're going to get married. That's it. We already know 
what type of dude this Michael guy is. So it's like no one's tried to help her. Like she's walking with a cane and not once did he try to help her along. He just left her. You know what I mean? So we already see his character. He ain't, he's trash too, you know? <laughs> now, based on what we learned earlier with the dad feeling guilt and that type of crap, I'm thinking the dad is the one, I think he pushed her down some stairs. If they're in a mansion, that means there's some high freaking staircases. I think he pushed her. I think that's why he's guilty. I feel, well, he feels guilty. And I think that's also why she's terrified because he's already shown her that he'll do anything to her. So if she's a problem, what would stop him from just getting rid of her? Like, I do understand why she has a clear fear of her father. I do. I feel bad for the girl. So we switch back to Brett. He's been texting with her. They're kind of going back and forth. He's scheduled to see her the following day. She tells him, um, it was something about, uh, a, a dream. She had asked him about, you know, did you dream about me in the text messages? And he says, I did, but I can't tell you cause it's dirty. And she's like, well, dirty's my favorite kind. You got to tell me now. So he tells her basically what they were doing. They were exercising. And they were fucking in between doing exercises. Very erotic. So then he was like, you know, we can't talk about these text messages tomorrow. So he he's like, you know, I won't say anything about them when you come in. We just will act like these text messages didn't happen. We'll leave it at that. Okay, cool. He goes on for the rest of his day. He, of course, is still thinking about her. She comes in the next day and she's just a little awkward he winds up turning away from her for a moment because he was having like such a dirty like such dirty thoughts and she was kind of like you're not getting she was about to ask you're not getting hard are you but she couldn't she didn't finish it and they kind of laugh and that broke the tension so then they were good but then he decides to ask her he's just like you know you can always talk to me she's like don't start this again <laughs> He's like, I'm just letting you know that I'm here. He's like, if you're not okay, you can let me know. I want to help. I can help you. She just says stop, but she doesn't get as pissy as she did before. The last conversation, you know, he does say to her, he's like, do you want me to stop texting you? And she's like, no, don't stop texting me. And he's like, okay, that was just a test. Um, so she's not mad and then this time when it was time for her to walk out she does let him help her um which is again a good sign she's not as mad as she was the last time but again for him he definitely wants her he's gonna figure out what happened um but he's trying to do everything like have her and figure out everything without losing his medical license i was like yeah you got a lot to overcome we switch back to Amber's POV. She gets up the next morning, heads downstairs. Her dad tells her everything's been worked out. She's going to marry Michael. And apparently Michael has, again, worked in some concessions for the two of them. He's like, he's a smart kid. I thought you would have wanted to have done that, but it doesn't matter. Everything's set now. Well, she starts panicking because she's like, I can't. I'm not doing this. And he goes, oh, yes, you will. And he grabs her arm and he says, you know what happened the last time? He's like, he's coming here later with the ring. You better accept it. You better not embarrass me. This deal is happening. She can smell the whiskey on his breath and it's like in the AM. So he leaves because he's got to go to work. She goes upstairs to her room. She texts Brett and says, I need to see you like now. Are you available? And he's like, yeah, just um, when can you get away? He says, um, she's like, you let me know. So he, there's a diner that's close by the clinic. And he's like, meet me there at 11. She's like, okay. So she doesn't have a car, but she'll get an Uber so she can go and meet him. So she gets to the diner. He calls her name. She doesn't hear him. So when he comes up behind her and grabs her arm to help her, she jumps. He helps her inside. They sit down. 
and he likes this place because it's not too crowded plus it's close to the clinic and he clearly knows something's happened she wants to talk but she's clearly nervous and she's like you might not she's you know like you you probably not gonna believe me but it all comes spilling out so she tells the whole story so a few months back her dad saw this ranch aka dave's ranch that he thinks based on some uh geologist there's oil that can be drilled but after offering the dave guy a slew of money the guy didn't want it um they found another way to tie them in so he came up with the idea of the kids getting married and so she tells him you know i met him that's where i was yesterday or the other day and she tells him you know the michael guy he's not too unfortunate but at the same time i don't want to get married to him and so brent's listening to this and he's looking agitated He's like, you shouldn't have to marry him unless that's something that you want, you know? And he says, tell me what happened to your leg. So she tells him her and her dad have been fighting about this whole marriage thing for a while. She says that it came to a head one day. And she told him, I'm not going to do it. Like, I'm not marrying this guy. And she had gotten halfway down the stairs and her dad kicked her in the back and knocked her down the rest of the stairs. And that's how she, that's how she fell. That's how she broke her femur. So Brett's like, we got to go to the police, you know, X, Y, and Z. She's like, we can't do that. She's like, if you do that, I'll say it never happened. He's like, why are you trying to protect your father? She says he knows people in the police department. He donates to them. He's got friends. I don't trust anyone in the police department. So Brent tells her, I'll protect you. She's like, I can't ask you to do that. He says, you're not asking me. I'm telling you what I'm going to do. He says, "Um, people I want, I protect and I want you. And so he tells her, you know, he's, he, you know, he wants to get her away from that house. Like she needs to do it ASAP, but she's more than likely going to go back to that house because I don't know, I guess, where is she going to go? But he tell, he did tell her, if you ever feel unsafe, lock yourself in your room and call me. I'll be there again. She's like, I can't ask, you know, you to do that. He's like, you're not asking me. I'm telling you. So they eat a little bit. He's pissed while they're eating. It's like he has this rage (laughs) because he's clearly very upset from what she told, from what she told him. And it's the idea that he physically, the father physically attacked her. And now he's trying to push her into something else. It's just, ah, it's just irking him. So he's got a truck and she's like, really, you have a truck? He's like, we're in Texas. He's like, I think they give them to you when you, when you come here, you know? So he winds up kissing her before she gets in the truck. She of course loves it. Um, It's kind of like that last threshold they hadn't crossed. And now she kind of feels like, um, I don't know it. Will he stick to protecting her? You know? She hopes that's what he'll do. Um, But regardless, she gets in the truck and he's still going to wind up taking her home. I guess I should say taking her to her father's home. (laughs) So we switch to uh, Brent's POV. He's fuming, you know, with that story he heard. He's trying to figure out a plan because this is crazy. They text. He's like, you know. Do you have any friends that you can go maybe stay with? She's like, they're all out of state. He says, what about family? She's like, not really. He said, okay, I get that. I have a family too that they're kind of odd, you know, that type of thing. So later on, he gets a phone call from her and he can hear the yelling in the background, pounding on the door. And she's like, he found our text messages. She's like, I locked myself in the bathroom and he's trying to get in here. And he's like, is there any way for you to get out of the bathroom? She's like, there's a window, but I don't know if I can do it, you know, with her bum leg. He's like, well, send me your address right now. I'm coming over. I'm going to ring the doorbell to drive him away 
uh, from the bathroom door to give you some time to get out. So he gets there in about 10 minutes and uh, rings the doorbell, bams on the door. Finally, the father comes to the door and he's like, I know you. What do you want? And he's like, um, I came over to talk to uh, Amber about some CT scans. And there were some concerns that we found. Some shadows. And he's like, what? He's like, you mean like cancer? Is that what it could be? And he's like, it could be or it could be that something didn't heal correctly. I don't know. So the father goes to get her, goes upstairs. Thankfully, the whole time he was talking to the dad, he kind of drew out the conversation. I just made it really short. Um, <laughs> uh, while he was doing that, that was giving our girl time to get out. And he could see in his peripheral that she had gotten out and she was working her way to his truck. So he walks off and is helping her get into the truck when the dad comes back to the door and he's like, I can't find her. Then he yells because he sees her. And the Brent yells out something like something about something. Calls him a motherfucker or something. And he gets her in that truck and he jumps in. And they peel out of there. Again, he's boiling with rage. She has her hand on his arm. And she's like, it's okay. You know, it's okay. But she's like, she knew she she knew he she couldn't stay there. You know, this was clearly only this is just going to get worse. He knows it, too. I don't think he wanted to drop her off there earlier anyway. This is clearly going to keep escalating with her father, you know, and. He tells her, I'm going to protect you. I told you I would protect I protect what I want and I want you. He's like, well, get your clothes and toiletries and everything else. But you don't have to worry about money, you know, and she's like, I mean, I know you're a doctor. She's like, but he's like, I told you money is not an issue for me. I come from a odd family, but we're well off. So I am very curious to find out about this family. Like, I'm wondering, are they in the oil business? Like, what's really going on? I'm so curious. Um, But he's he's going to take care of her. But I am concerned with the father because the father saw her getting into his truck. What, you know, I'm sure he's going to report the guy to the medical board for some type of inappropriate behavior. Something. You know he's going to do something. That's my little concern. We switch back to Amber's POV. They pull up to his place. He has his cabin. It's like off in the cut. And she thought he would have been in like this apartment condo type of thing, you know. But he says, no, this is home. So they go inside. This is nothing like the outside. The inside is very modern, you know, absolutely amazing. He gives her a little tour. He winds up carrying her upstairs. And there's a guest room. Um, and they're talking about the fact that she had made a comment about him having like a bunch of women come through here. And he was like, honestly, you're the first person I've ever brought here. He tells her, you know, back in the day, I could do stuff like that. You know, I was younger. It was easier. He's 34, by the way. Um, but he he's like, but he doesn't do that now. So then there's a bam on the door. She hears her father's voice. He goes to the door. The first, first, I'm sorry, the father tried to call her phone. She saw it, but she didn't answer it. Then they heard the banging and then the hollering. So Brent goes to open the door. The dad's like, she's coming with me and all this crap. You're her doctor. This is unethical, all this type of shit. And he, um, Brent is like, she's not going anywhere with you. And she's like, yeah, she's like, I'm not going with you. And so then Brent grabs him, puts him up against the wall and says, did I invite you into my home? He's like, and te Texas has wonderful homestead laws, you know? <laughs> so the dad kind of seems a little fearful with Brent. And Brent lets him know, I know what you did. You know, I know you kicked her down the stairs. And he goes, oh, she told you that? She's just a little liar. He's like, nah, she's not. So then he's yelling at her, you need to come with me now. She's like, no, I'm not going anywhere with you. 
Um, I think seeing someone stand up to her father definitely gave her some strength, you know, somewhere to pull some strength from because she was absolutely terrified of this man. You know what I mean? But seeing that Brent has no fear of him and is determined to keep her safe. I think it helped her say the stuff that she said to her dad when she yelled at him. was like, no, I'm not coming with you. You know, that's not happening. And so the father realizes this is not a fight. He's going to win today. But he does tell them both of you are going to regret this. And he did talk about reporting him for violation, unethical shit and all that type of stuff. And he says, this is not over. So he leaves and he, you know, realizes that this is going to keep happening. Like this guy's going to keep coming for her because he needs her for that deal, you know? And she's kind of figuring out, like, how did he find me? And so Brent's like, do you have that, um, what is it called? that find my friend or something like that on your phone. And she's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, he was tracking you. That's how. So she's like, shit, you know what I mean? I guess, but again, I don't know why this, I will say this. I'm not really sure why she's shocked by this behavior. When he kicked you down the stairs, you know what I mean? Like I put nothing past you. If you will kick me downstairs. You will clearly do anything, but she does feel safe. And that, and I was like, good for you, boo, because you have a horrible father. We switch back to Brent's POV. It's the next morning. We find out that night he had broke her phone, took, took, took an ax to it out back, chopped that bitch up. <laughs> he waits for her to come down for breakfast to let her know what the plan is. He's like, I've got a plan. She's like, what is it? So he's like, we're going to my parents. It's the safest place. So his parents live in Virginia. That's where he's from. He explains to her, like, I come from a wealthy family. Like, not that we just found a couple dollars, like no generational money. Like they were the first ones that came over on a boat, that type of, you know, thing. They got long money, okay? And so she's like, do you get along with your family? And he's like, you know, I go there maybe a day or two every now and then. You know, it's been a while, though, since I've been there. She, of course, is like, I don't want you doing something that you don't want to do, especially if you don't really deal with your family like that, you know? He says safety, your safety is what matters. And honestly, that's the safest place you'll be. He says, my family's paranoid. They've got top-notch level security, safer place in the world for you to be. So he's already ordered her some clothes. He's gotten them packed. Um, she goes upstairs, take a shower. They're going to drive there. It's a 20-hour drive. He wants to do it in two stints, you know, two 10-hour days. She wants to break it up into three. So we get a little bit more information about... Well, I'm not going to say, a, we, we just get a little bit more information about his family. So the reason that he's at odd with his family is because they didn't want him to become a doctor. So he has a brother named Jacob. He's in finance. He lives in New York, trade stocks. He makes money for the family. Um, this works because you're putting more money into the fold, right? You're making us wealthier. You're keeping that money going. They're cool with that. But... They don't want you actually working, like just doing a job because, you know, you're trying to help people like, uh, uh, you know, that just doesn't really work with them. So when he went to med school, they were actually very upset with him that he was doing that. So he knows this is going to be a trip, but at the same time, he knows this is the safest, safest place for her to be. And he clearly is very much infatuated with her and wants to keep her safe. Um, he's a little concerned about her seeing that, I guess that rage come out of him, but I'm like, baby, she already done seen it. Like you clearly have it. You know, if I see you trying to contain your rage, bitch, I know you got rage. You know what I mean? Like it's clearly there. 
So they're going along. She winds up having to pee. They stop at like a rest stop or whatever. It's not too many people there. She comes out. He tells her, I want you to remember this feeling no matter what happens. Remember how I make you feel. So he's kissing her and then he puts her in the back truck like the back cab. Because he's got a big truck. He fingers her and eats her pussy until she comes. And she just stays in that back cab. And she's like i'll just take a nap you know and he's like yeah you go ahead and you do that so again i'm just kind of like what do you mean hold on to the fact that i just made you feel good what the fuck you got me walking into now don't get it twisted she's clearly coming from a fucked up situation with her dad and she didn't feel like anybody else could help her but i'm like what exactly are you taking her to we switch back to amber's pov and they did do what she wanted. They split it into three days. And they're right outside of Charlottesville, Virginia. And the town is called Loftville. Because when she asks, he's like, don't laugh. But it, yeah, it's called Loftville. Um, she says it looks like it, 1950s happened. And then everything just stopped. It still looks really nice. Like it's clearly clept up, kept up. But... It just, it just seems a little weird because it does seem like it's stuck. So he explained that his family owns these buildings. They rent them out to people at apparently a really low rate. Um, but for some reason, the people still don't like his family, but they like the rates. But I'm like, hmm. So they keep driving. Eventually, they get to the house. Security is crazy. Like, you don't see the gates at first, and then they're, here they come. They go inside. The but butler's name is Archie. And... Um, Again, this place is beyond huge. He's walking with her and then his sister Laura comes in and, and he's like, I thought you were in Paris. She's like, yeah, it got boring. I came back. And she's like, mommy's in a mood. She's mad at dad because he was out hunting and brought back a bunch of pheasants. So he says um, she's going to need some toiletries or whatever. And she's like, oh, that's fine. We got it. I, I can help her. So she actually helped her along when she was taking her to where they keep all the toilet toiletries. And I said, well, right there, I can tell she's decent, at least decent. I don't know what she's going to be in the future, but she's at least a decent person, you know? So she takes her to where they keep the toiletries. It looks like a pharmacy. It's so huge in there. Gives her a bag. She gets all the stuff she needs. The sister, of course, wants to know, like, what's the deal with the two of you? And... You know, you're the first person that he's ever brought here. And she's just like, I didn't know that. She's like, you don't know what your deal is or the fact that he brought someone here. She's like the second one. <laughs> and she's like, I don't know what it is. He was my doctor, you know. And that's all I pretty much know. He was. So the sister's like, well clearly he's in he's very much into you you should see the way he looks at you it looks like he wants to keep you forever you know and she says he's really protective you know that's that's just one of his traits so they leave they go up she goes back to brent they go upstairs he carries her up they're gonna share a room he tells her he'll sleep on the couch and she's just kind of like why are you like what are you worried about with your family you know are they bad people like what exactly is it he's like they're not bad they're just not good it's he's like it's a lot but this is where i'm like you had three fucking days to explain the the, the family dynamic so she's got a better idea of what she's walking into but he's not really saying stuff you know, and she can tell he's holding back. He's not telling her everything. Not that you're going to tell me every single thing. But my thing is, just give me a better understanding. You know, that's all I'm saying he could have did for. Her. So. The butler comes up, uh, brings their stuff, tells him the parents want them down for dinner. So, um everyone it seems like everyone kind of lives in this house given very much dallas dynasty okay everyone lives in this in this home and so 
she just kind of I don't know she she's she's nervous of course and he takes a nap and she takes a shower but before she takes a shower she just kind of cries you know just kind of lets it all out everything that's happened these past couple days and for what she's possibly about to walk into so we switch back to Brent's POV um as he was waking up she was coming out of the shower he of course is ready to pounce on her but he doesn't he does tell her like wear something nice it's like formal that's how they do dinners and stuff like that um he puts his clothes on he's he was naked he just put he was naked and he just put them on in front of her and, and they almost fucked but they didn't do it they go downstairs the parents are already there because they're ready to meet her the mother's staring at her the father's pretty he's jovial you know he appears you know to be pretty light-hearted he had made a little uh joke about the cane how he sh you know man of his age should have a cane and a top hat and she was like uh amber goes i think you can pull it off you might be able to pull it off you know and the mother's like oh gosh don't start that you know and then his aunt and uncle louise and ronald come out louise has she's never worked a day in her life um but she knows everything in the world about purses the history of them everything she doesn't shake Amber's hand or anything. She just kind of throws up a little a little wave. Eventually, the mother asks her, what does her family do? And she says what her father does. And she says, you know, they're not getting along right now. And the conversations, it gets a little weird, but then eventually the conversation moves on. And he eventually gets her out of there and she says you know what did i do and he says well you know we really don't talk about money and family troubles that's just something you don't do but she was like but they were talking about the money that they donate to charities and stuff like that and he said yeah but that's them giving money to people but not them talking about their actual wealth of what they do but it's like the fucking mother asked her what does her family do and she told him now did she have to say me and my father aren't getting along right now no she didn't have to say that but why the fuck did you not tell her hey listen don't bring up the issues with your dad he's all like you know they look down on stuff like that but again why didn't you tell her you could have prepared her for that it could have been a two minute fucking conversation you know where you could have told her listen you can say your dad works in oil um don't say anything about the fact of what's going on between you and your dad my family doesn't really like to talk about family issues that's not even two minutes okay but he didn't even do that he didn't even do that so that's what like pisses me off with him is like he didn't prepare her and he could have and so now she looking crazy she doesn't know your family she doesn't know your dynamics you know what I'm saying? It's like he could he just could have warned her. He pissed me off. Ugh. But anyway, he picks her up, carries her upstairs. I think he threw her on the bed. And I'm like, well, how you threw the girl? She got a fucked up leg. But that's what he did. So we're still in Amber's POV. They have a nice lovey dovey little they have a nice little session. They 69 each other and then they have a nice heart fuck it's beyond amazing he of course is saying to her throughout it like you know you're mine and she's like yes i'm yours and um she's never had sex like this before so she's a goner he tells her you know i can't wait till you get better because then that's when the fun will really begin we switch back to brent's pov um the next morning they go to the gym um, he had his family install this gym, even though no one goes down there. I think he said a couple, his brother, he has two brothers, Jacob and Sean. They use it sometimes when they come in, you know, but other than that, no one uses this place. So she asked him, she knows what Jacob does for a living. She asked him what Sean does, but he wouldn't answer her. Then it became something about, um, she said something to him about bringing girls here. Um, he had to, he should have been like a babe magnet, you know, 
And he's like, well, kind of hard to do that when I went, I was in boarding schools throughout the year and I only came here for summers. And he's like, no, nah, when I was away, that's when I had on my phone with different women. And he's like, but you know, those women just prepared me for you or whatever. Cause he asked her like, are you getting jealous? And she's like, no, she's like, nice. Nah, if you're not jealous that you're like the hundredth man I've before me. And he goes, okay, I am getting jealous. You better be kidding. Um, all this type of stuff. So then they have a hard workout and then Laura comes in and she's like, I saw something and I wanted to tell you all about it. So she goes and gets her laptop, comes back and Samuel Gibbons has put up a freaking Facebook post saying that he will give someone a million dollars to bring his daughter back. He put Brent's full name, Brent Lofthouse saying that you know this guy seduced his daughter he's unethical all this type of crap but he they, he's put a b fucking bounty on his daughter to bring her back and amber goes white you know her face goes white just pale and she's like i just thought you should know what was going on she's like you know mom and dad are not gonna like this they don't like their name out there like that he's like i know i'll handle it i'll handle it so they did tell the sister about the fact that the father was the one that did this to her because Amber got so pissed. She's like, he's the one that did this to me. And now he's doing this, you know? And so she's like, what if your parents make us leave? He's like, don't worry about it. I'll handle it. All this type of stuff. But he's like, in order for them to help us, we are going to have to tell them everything. And I'm just like, this is a mess. But again, I'm not shocked. I knew that dad was going to do something. I just didn't know what the hell it was going to be. But I knew he was going to do something because he wasn't going to let that girl go away that quickly, that easily, shall I say. So Amber decided she wanted to go for a walk. Brent, of course, was like, I'll go with you. She's like, no, I just need to be by myself. I need to get my thoughts together. And you said exercise will be good for me. And so he tells her about the path that's along the property where he can see her. She'll be okay. Um, and if she yells, he can hear. Her. So she goes, she's thinking about everything. She knows her dad isn't going to stop. You know, the crazy part is if she was kidnapped, he wouldn't pay a million dollars for her. But he's paying a million dollars now because her value, he needs this deal to go through, which is going to make him more money. So she's getting ready to do a second walk and she hears rustling. So she calls out Brent's name. It's not him. All of a sudden, someone scoops her up. They're like, shut up, bitch. I need this money. So they pick her up. She's trying to fight. She's screaming, help, help, help. And the person hits her in her bad leg. Almost passes out from the pain. And then all of a sudden, boom, here comes Brent. He gets her away from the guy, beats the guy to a pulp. She had to stop him because it seemed like he was about to kill the man. It really did. So it was the groundskeeper whose name is Hamish. He was like, you know, Brent was like, why? He was like, I needed the money. I said, this is why this is going to be a problem because everyone is going to want that money. All of them. They're going to want it. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> this happened on the property <laughs> with one of the workers. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. He also made a comment um, before when she kept saying, you know, she's like, don't kill him. He had made a comment. It wouldn't be the first time we got rid of a body on this land. So again, this place, these people have got secrets. Um, clearly for that comment to be said. So he takes her back up to the house. She feels relief because she really thought she was a goner. She realizes, you know, that him being possessive of her and protective of her are two things that she really likes so brent lets her know he's calling the family together they all meet up 
The other two people that are in the house are Hannah and Colin. I want to say they're Louise and Ron's kids. I think they are. I'm not sure, but I think they are. Um, so he tells them what's going on. He doesn't tell them that the father knocked her down the stairs because she didn't want them to know, which I feel these you want these people to put themselves in harm's way then they should be told everything that's just my opinion you know i don't feel like you get to ask someone to put themselves in harm's way but i ain't got to tell you everything like i don't think that's cute at all you know i would think you would want them to know because clearly he's an awful person this happened they need to know what he's capable of doing you know, him doing this could just appear like putting up that Facebook post that could just kind of be like a concerned father, right? Like someone took my daughter and I'm trying to get her back. Like she's in a bad situation. I'm trying to get her back. But if you explain, Hey, he kicked me down the stairs, <laughs> you know, these people need context. <laughs> and I didn't understand why she apparently didn't want that to be told i thought that was just fucking stupid <laughs> just like i was on his ass about the fact that he should have gave her more information about how his family dynamic works you know what i mean like she's walking into the situation let her know what the fuck she's walking into so i guess they both just like to leave shit out i don't know <laughs> So his mother, Sylvia, is the one that makes the decisions, okay? It's her, not the father. She makes them. And she was like, she can stay for now. But she tells her, you stay out of trouble. She, you know, doesn't like that their name has now been put out with some foolishness, you know? And none of the other family members like it, you know. And so when they leave, he does say to her, you know, my family lives in a bubble, lives in a bubble. And every now and then something happens and they have to interact with the real world and they don't like it. Hannah is one of those people. She wasn't happy either. She was one of the cousins. She feels this is a problem. This is the family name that's being sullied. This is not okay. They don't know this damn girl. She's not up for this. Colin is okay because he's excited that Brent, you know, beat up Hamish to a pulp. So he's fine. Laura, of course, is on their side. She's happy because there's some drama going on and normally it's boring. <laughs> So she likes when more family's there because she gets the drama. Um, Uncle Ron and his father go to like the cigar room, listen to some jazz. And then uh, Brent takes Amber into her room, closes the door and lets her know, I'm going to protect you. I'm not letting you go. That's just not an option. So he takes her into this room. She can't even like take the room in because he's like overwhelming her senses with all of his kisses he starts eating her pussy they of course have a nice hard fuck afterwards she goes like why what's the deal with hannah and he's like you really want to have this conversation right after we fuck like really you know and she's like yeah she's like what's the deal with her and he's like she's a really smart person but she's very protective when it comes to the loft house name she's very protective but She's like, but that doesn't make sense. It's got to be something else, you know? And he's like, you got to remember, I grew up being told certain things are not to be talked about. And so for me, this is just the way things are, you know? He was ready to fuck again. She's like, nope, I want to take a shower. And um, she's like, if you pick me up, just take me so I can get a shower. So he went ahead and he took her. Next morning, they wake up, Laura comes, and she's like, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. <laughs> but your dad has now gone to CNN and done an interview. She brings out her laptop. He's interviewing with an anchor. Just an absolute mess. Um, Laura tells her, apparently there's things on Reddit. There's like this Amber Hunters group. There's all kind of forums dedicated to trying to find her. Like this shit's getting out of control. 
So Brent's like, he's going to go talk to his mother. Amber done broke down. Poor girl, she's crying. He tells Laura, stay with her. Don't leave her. She's like, I won't. I'll stay with her. Brent goes to see his mother. She's in her room. Normally, they're not supposed to disturb her, but at this point, he's got to do it. So this is where she paints. So the mother's an artist. But she doesn't do it for the world to see. Um, probably in like another life she would have been an artist, but this allows her, I guess, to still have, still be able to, to create, you know? So she tells him she's already seen the interview and she's like, she's got to go. She's like, our name means a lot. We take care of a lot of people and we can't have our name being sullied like this. We can't do it. He wanted to go on the defense and release a statement. She said, absolutely not. She tells him, you know, your father's upset. He's like, he's always upset, you know. But he's like, which I was like, no, he's not. He's a, He seemed to be pretty jovial. But then again, this is just our first time meeting him. So we don't really know how he is. Um, So he kind of stood up to her and he said that, you know, he's the eldest. He's the heir to everything. And he'll figure out a plan. X, Y, and Z. Because the mother was like, I'll have security escort both of you out. But he knows, I think there's certain things his mom might not cross because she doesn't want to lose him forever. And I think she kind of knows this is something that could push him away for good. And she clearly doesn't want that. Um, he did tell the mom about the fact that the dad was the one that broke her leg. The mother was just like, what does that have to do with us? She can see he's in love with her. She's like, you probably don't even see it, you know, but I know you're in love with her. But again, that doesn't have anything to do with us. Amber notices that uh, Brent seems like he's in a lighter mood when he came back from his mom, but he wouldn't go into any details about the conversation. So she's assumed, okay, everything's going pretty good. She gets hungry. She goes downstairs, acts, um, Oh gosh, what's his name? I think I think the chef's name is Dorian, if I'm not mistaken. She's gonna go downstairs and ask Dorian for something um, to eat. And before she leaves, Brent says, uh, "There's been a little change." Well, she goes outside and there's two security guards, Patrick's and Johnson. So at first she was mad, but then it was like, you know what? It actually does feel safer. <laughs> So she goes downstairs, the chef, ye the chef yells at her, but he makes her an omelet. It's the best thing she's ever had. The chef's happy with her reaction. He leaves. So then she thinks it's the girl that brought her the tea, but it's not. It's Sylvia coming in to talk to her. And they have a conversation and Sylvia tells her the truth. She doesn't want her here. And that she needs to do what's right. She tells her the story of how when she was 19, she had loves and she had friends. And when her father came to her and said, you're going to marry a loft house. That's what I did. So she knows about the arranged marriage. She said, I've made calls too. I have ways of finding out stuff. And she's also found out that her dad, Samuel, has been calling around trying to find out about the loft houses and trying to get more information about their influence. And she can't have that, you know? And so her mother's like, he's trying to fracture something that's been in place for too long. Can't do it. Um, she's honest with her. She wants her to go and she needs her to make the right decision. So Amber's confused because she doesn't want to leave Brent, but she doesn't want to stay here knowing that the mother doesn't want her here. And on top of everything, you know, it's like, if you, if you stay like, this is going to cause a strain with his relationship with his family, which is already strained. You know what I mean? But then going back to her father feels like a hard no too. So she's just between a rock and a hard place. Brent knows something's up with Amber. She's not talking. She's reading a book, but she will not open up to him. So he winds up fingering her, making her come, and then they talk. So she tells him she talked to his mother. She knows the mother doesn't want him doesn't want her here. Um, and she's like, at any moment, she could just kick me out. Like, we can't stay here, you know? So then he's like, I know we've got to come up with a plan. He's like, I just hadn't come up with one, so I didn't want to worry you. He says, um, but I need to talk to your dad. I need to figure out something. 
something that I can give him that won't force you into this marriage and call off the hunt. So she's going to take a nap and he's going to try and get in contact with the dad. So Amber wakes up from her nap and when she comes downstairs, um, she's doing a little bit better now, which is good. She gets snatched. <laughs> they put a hood over her head. They pull her into a room. She's kicking and screaming. They tell her, just calm down. It's Hannah and Colin. So this is what's going on. Their parents have, haven't been given the money. And they have very expensive tastes. And so because they like, they're like the black sheep of the family, they're not like the golden children. So the five children that Sylvia had, those are the golden kids. Okay? Um, because... I can't remember what in the world. Um, I remember Sylvia's name, uh, Brent's mother. I don't remember the dad's name. But the dad is the oldest, right? So his children are the ones that are going to inherit everything. So they're like the golden kids. And Hannah and Colin are not. So they've decided they're going to take her back to her dad and get that million dollars and split it. Because I'm my thing though is this if you've got expensive taste, bitch, a million is not gonna last that long with you. It can't. You're gonna run through it. But I think when you just want a couple of dollars, you just want a couple of dollars. So it's like <laughs> I don't think they care. So they threatened her and told her, listen, we will smash your head in, you know? And if you die, you die. We find out they send her security away saying that Sylvia needed them. And Brent, I guess, I don't know, I guess he was on the ground doing, looking at security stuff or whatever. Um, so now they're taking her out. She's not kicking and screaming and they put her in a vehicle. Brent, of course, is like, what do you mean you lost her? So Patrick's and Johnson say, well, when we came back to check on her, she was gone. We went to go check on Mrs. Lofthouse. And he's like, who told you to do that? Eventually they admit it was Hannah and, and Colin that came to him. And so now he knows that's who have her. Well, then he also finds out, because Johnson just tells it all, honey, that trackers have been put on everyone's car. Whenever the family comes into town, Sylvia has security put trackers on their vehicles. And he's like, and who over, who looks over that? Sylvia and guess where her setup is in her painting room so they find out where the vehicle is it's in town they get there he's like there's apartments above because there's like a laundromat and different stuff and he's like they've got to be in one of those he tells Patrick and Johnson you guys stay down here make sure no one leaves he goes upstairs knocks on a woman's door it's an older lady she knows these two they're the youngest people that live in that building and she says they're assholes so she tells them tells him right away where they are so he goes knocks on the door he can hear hannah and colin colin's like I, it might be a package and hannah's like did you order anything so colin opens the door brent punches him right in the face kicks him a few time times hannah's screaming she's like you don't understand we needed the money so he's like, where is she? Where is she? Where is she? She's in the back room. So he goes and gets her. Hannah's like, we can't let you take her. We need the money. We've got a lot of debt. And he's like, you could have just asked, you know, she and they were like, we don't have access to money like like you guys do, you know. And so. He was about to punch the mess out of Hannah, but he didn't do it. <laughs> he wasn't going to hit her. But he scared the shit out of her. <laughs> he was just pissed. He's like, you want to take her back to the her abusive father? They were like, we, they ain't got nothing to do with us. They just needed to get the money, you know? So they leave out. They get back down. And boom. Guess what? Patrick pulls out a gun. Patrick's like, I need that money. I don't care about this job. So Johnson wrestles and gets the gun away from him nobody got shot even though the gun went off patrick's is, is um like you know why are you helping these rich people they don't care anything about you and johnson was like i like my job 
So Brett let him know we're squared away because he was giving them hell about the fact that they had let that girl go. Um, but letting them know his job is safe. You know, you can keep your job. No problem. So as they're leaving out, they see a big black truck and it's the dad. And she's like, oh, my gosh, just a few more minutes and he would have got me. But Brent was like, this got to end. This has to end. Like, he's got too much money, and he's just going to keep coming after us. Brent goes back to the house. Him and Amber, um, they're talking with the mother and father. The mother is the one that handles, again, everything. She's pissed off about Hannah and Colin, and she's like, they're going to have to learn their place. So she's going to get in their ass. So then he told, so then um, Brent told the mother, I need a favor. She's like, what? He's like, I need a loan. She's like, you have plenty of money. He's like, no, I need a big loan. I'm going to need to make an offer. So she tries to act like the business isn't doing as good as it used to, but he knows that's a lie because his brother makes plenty of money with this stuff. So he knows. So she says, okay, fine. You can have however much you want. You don't have to pay it back, but here's the stipulation. You have to move back to Virginia. You don't have to stay in this town. I get it. But you've got to live in the state of Virginia. You have to visit us at least twice a month. We need to see you more. And he says, deal. The dad's happy because he's like, it would be nice to see you more, you know, and stuff like that. Amber's like, I can't let you do this, you know. She's like, I know how much happiness it brought for you not to be with your family. Like, you can't do this for me. He's like, it's done. So... They book some plane tickets back to Texas um, and they head straight to Dave's ranch or David. They've been calling him Dave. His name's David. And she has a conversation with Michael and Dave is talking with Brent and Michael tells her, you know, when she, cause she tells Michael, like, I don't want to marry you. And she tells him the other stuff about the dad and stuff. And he didn't realize the shit was as big as it was, as bad as it was. He really had no idea. He's like, that's fine by me. We don't have to get married. He's like, I don't even want to stay in this business of ranch anyway. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to do this shit, you know? So Amber and Michael go up to Dave and Brent. And Michael tells his dad, like, we're not getting married. The deal's not happening. He says, and I don't want to run this ranch. He's like, sell it. And his dad says, I'll do anything for my boy. So he tells Brent, you've got a deal. So Amber gets in the truck with Brent. And she's like, how much did you offer him? And he says, he took my first offer, which was $20 million. So he was going to go high as it took. But the mom said, "Take what, get what you need. So there was no limit. So that's how you know they got nasty fucking money. <laughs> um, so now they've got leverage. They now own the land that that father wants. Let's see how this goes. They go back to Virginia. And they have the dad come to the family home. He's looking around their home like, oh, yeah, this is nice. This is what I'm talking about. This type of wealth, this type of power. This is what excites him. So they sit him down. This is the agreement. Amber shouts out different times at him. She calls him a piece of scum. She says he's the worst thing. She hopes he dies alone. She tells him, I hope you choke on your own vomit. Like she is saying whatever she feels. And I love it because he has been absolutely awful to her. And has been making her life a living hell. So I, I love it. So here's the deal. They'll give him the ranch. If. He runs an ad. Using the same amount of money. Saying you know that he lied about the whole thing. With. Um, saying that she was taken and all this type of bullshit. He's got to basically do a retraction and he's got to uh, agree to a restraining order. He can never come near Amber again. Well, he's like, she's my daughter. And she's like, I'm nothing to you. Don't you know that? So he's like, if I give these two things, you'll give me that land. He says, deal. 
so then he gets up and they do the shaking of hands and Brent grabs him and lets him know that if he ever comes near Amber again, he'll break his leg the same way he did her, the same way he did to his daughter, you know, and it rattles old Samuel. He leaves out. And that's when they decide to say their I love you. So he says, I love you first. And then she says, I love you too. And he asks her, are you going to move? Or, you know, would you move to Virginia? And she says, I sure will. We fast forward a year. Um, Amber's still not at 100%, but she's pretty freaking close. Uh, she thinks probably within the next year, she'll be back to her normal self. They live in Virginia. They are pretty close to D.C. So, you know, the stipulation was they had to remain in Virginia. So they got as close to D.C. as they could. <laughs> he works a lot at the new clinic. Um, it takes a lot of work opening a clinic. He sold the one in Texas and then opened up this one. She's been helping restore the home that they bought. It's an older house and she's been, you know, overseeing and doing those renovations. She hasn't seen her dad. Um, I'm kind of pissed. I kind of wanted to know how that turned out with the land. You know what I mean? Like, was there really oil on the land? What happened to him? I don't know. I, I wonder. I think there are like five or seven books in this uh, series. But, you know, each one of them are individual. So I don't know if we ever find out. But I would have liked to have known what happened with him, you know. I don't know. I just would have liked to have gotten that. So anyway, she comes in to the clinic and he recreated the kind of like the gym where they, where they first had, where they first had their exercising things back in Texas, their first session. And he lights it up with candles and stuff. And he asked her to marry him. She of course said, yes, they're going to do like a ceremony for themselves at city hall and then like a family one, you know, a big shindig at the loft house. But he's fine with that. At least they'll have their own moment. Um, they go to the house, the family house, probably about once a week. You know, they have their lives, their separate lives. And it's been working out. And he carries her up so they can start expanding their family. And that's how it ends. So the other books are going to be about the other family members. So again, it's a, it, it is a series, but it's individual stories. So I thought this was a pretty good starter. So if you guys want to jump into that series, feel free. I think it'll probably be pretty good. I'll do that on my own time. Um, what did you all think? I really liked it. Um, there's always going to be some character that will annoy me. <laughs> it's bound to happen. But I like, I just want to, I do want to know more about that family because they clearly have a lot of secrets. And that's why I think doing, reading the other books, I won't, I won't do them on the channel, but I think it'll probably be fun for us readers to read those other books to find out what happened with this family because they clearly are hiding some things um but i really liked it i thought it was cute it took a turn i didn't expect like it's called possessive doctor so i'm like okay it's probably a patient he's gonna fall for someone i figured that part the part about her father pushing her downstairs and you know putting up bounties like yo i didn't see that <laughs> that was like what and then the siblings, well, the cousins, actually, they were cousins, um, trying to kidnap her. Like, I didn't see that either because I thought, you know, they're so wealthy. Everyone has access to a good amount of money. But clearly, they had been cut off and they were desperate. So that was a, a wild twist. But let me know what you guys think. Drop down in the comment section and let me know. If you are in the market for a beautiful notebook or journal, I do have those available and the links are going to be available down below in the description section. Make sure you like and subscribe and share. And as always, I truly do thank you all for your support and thank you for tuning in to the Always Reading Book Club.